my video. Okay, now we're live. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Pound Room Field Station. I think that we're just going to pause a moment and make sure that people are joining us before I really get into things. Um, We've got one. One person. Excellent. Hello, viewer. <laughs> Well, now we have two people, so. Excellent. I'm going to, is it, it's, it is 8.30 now, so I'm just going to wait a little bit longer. Um, so I think, Oliver, what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce a little bit, and then I'll have you um, take the bird out, because we will need to release it. And we'll just uh, show people because it is one of our migratory species that we would like to talk about. Mm -hmm. Are things looking okay, guys? Um, we're having a hard time joining cool. from all the interviews. From what people are oh, okay. interviewing. No, this is the camera. Nope, that's it. That's right now. Oh, okay, cool. Great. It's live. Nice. Okay. It's Whoa. Cool. Yeah. Okay. How many viewers do you have right now? We have seven. Okay, excellent. I think that I'll just get going because this is going to be recorded anyway. So, um, welcome to In the Field Live, um, another Palomarin Field Station edition. Um, this is also a special edition. We'll be talking about migratory birds. Um, where do our birds go? So we'll talk a little bit about some of our migratory species and some of the things that we do to research where our birds go. Um, and this is also the Biodiversity Day edition as well. Um, so September 7th is uh, California Biodiversity Day, um, and Governor Brown in 2018 uh, launched a California Biodiversity Initiative, um, and he also launched the California uh, Biodiversity Day. So um, this year we have, uh, from the September 5th to the 13th, we have there are various events being um, hosted by the California Natural Resource Agency um, to celebrate California biodiversity. California is a very biodiverse state, um, and we here at Point Blue uh, do a lot of research on various ecosystems and um, plants and animals that live in California, so this is very um, synergistic to talk about what we do here at the field station um, during this celebration of Biodiversity Day week. Um, and there will be a link uh, where you can go and see some of the other events that are happening this week um, through that Biodiversity Day. Um, okay, so there will also be a, um, a link to donate. So um, a lot of the work that we do here at Point Blue, um, it relies on donations and foundations. And so um, if you're interested in the work that we're doing here to protect uh, biodiversity, you can uh, donate to us, please. Um, okay, so right now we have a bird in the lab, and, and I'm going to have Oliver um, grab the bird out. My name is Hillary Allen. I'm an avian ecologist here working at the Palmer and Field Station. This is Oliver. Oliver is a, um, an intern at the Palmer and Field Station. They are learning how to ban birds and take uh, various information on these birds. So this morning, um, we opened our mist nets at 7 o'clock. Um, we open, we have uh, 20 mist nets in this area that we open uh, six days a week, um, and we open them 15 minutes after sunrise, and we have them open for the first six hours of the day. We check the nets every 30 minutes, um, and we collect any birds that are in the net. So we did catch a bird this morning, and this is one of our migratory species um, that we're going to talk about. So um, this here is a thrush, and we actually have two, can you see? Okay, great. Um, so we have uh, two common thrush species around here. Um, this is a Swainson's thrush. Um, the other common thrush species that we have is the hermit thrush. Um, and they look very, very similar. Um, excellent. Okay, so we've actually had this bird for a little while, so we're going to let it go, but we wanted to make sure that you all got to see a bird. We have someone out on a net run right now, so hopefully he will come back with birds as well. Um, thank you, Oliver. You can let that bird go. Um, so, the Swainson's thrush, they are here during spring and summer, so they breed here um, in the Point Reyes National 
Seashore um, and Marin County. And uh, so they are one of the species that we have um, quite a lot of information on where they go during the winter months. Um, and we, bird banding was started um, long, long ago to uh, try to determine where birds were going because, you know, we have different species that are here in the winter and then they leave and we have different species that come um, here for the breeding season in the spring and summer. And so the, uh, originally people wanted to learn where birds were going because they just mysteriously leave and, uh, and show back up. And so bird banding was first started to uh, try to answer where do the birds go. Um, and so bird banding is, what we do when we're banding birds is we put a unique nine digit, uh, there's a unique nine digit number on one of these um, aluminum bands. The bands themselves are really lightweight. Um, and so when we catch a bird, we determine what the species is and then we determine what size band um, goes on the bird. Once we put a band on a bird, that bird is then, um, we can identify it for the rest of its life with that, uh, with that unique nine digit number. And so uh, the goal originally was that we, there would be a lot of banding stations. A lot of people would be putting uh, bands on birds and then they would be catching birds from other banding stations and they would be able to see where the birds were coming from and where they were going to. Um, however, those types of captures don't happen all that often. It's quite rare for us, for instance, to catch a bird that was banded at another field station um, or banding station. And birds, we do often though catch the same birds that we caught in previous years. So something like a Swainson's thrush, that was a, uh, that was a recap Swainson's thrush actually. And so we have a lot of information on it from previous times that we captured it. Um, so we could even see if we captured it in a previous year. And so what happens with a lot of our migratory species that are either breeding here or spending their winter here, um, is that they come back to the same spot every year. And so that Swainson's thrush may come back here next year and then if we catch it again we'll be able to see that it has lived another year and that it came back to the same place. Um, so that's really interesting information. It's awesome to see that we have birds that are returning um, year after year but it is we still um, wanted to know more about where they're going when they leave this area um, and either head with, with the Swainson's thrush, for instance, when they head to their wintering grounds, we want to know where exactly they go. Um, and we also have several wintering species that leave for the summer, um, and we want to see where they go to breed as well. And so if you look in a, um, in a field guide, you can see there are range maps. Let's actually, I'm going to, I'll pull out the range map for a Swainson's thrush. So we can show people. So there's a general range where birds go to that we are, oh my gosh, I can't, <laughs> that we know, um, you know, roughly that there are any bird that is uh, spending the summer here is likely going further south. And so we know where those ranges may be. And so here is a range map of the Swainson's thrush, which is the, the thrush that we were hold, holding earlier today. Can you see that? Mm, yeah. Okay. Bring it all close. And so the orange there, that indicates where the birds are spending their summer. And you can actually see, thank you. Um, you can actually see that a blue would indicate where they spend their winter. And you can see from this um, particular map that there is no blue in this map. So, um, so their wintering range is further south than what this map shows. Um, but you can also see that they're, they have like a, they have a pretty wide range. They breed, you know, across the United States um, and then are migrating through and going south. And so um, recently, as the past like 10 or so years, um, technology has gotten smaller so that we can actually uh, track these birds um, using GPS and geolocator tags. And I'm going to show you what a we have two types of tags that we can now put on some of our um, migratory species to see where they go. This here is a. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a geolocator tag, um, a light level geolocator tag. 
Um, and then we have here a GPS tag. And you can see they're roughly the same size. They're very small, um, but they are, whenever we um, catch a bird, so the bands that we use are very, very small and so they do not bother the bird at all. When you put a little backpack on a bird, these are very small, but compared to a bird, they are you know, relatively large. So we want to make sure that we're putting these on a species that is big enough to, um, to carry this for an entire year and not be bothered by it at all. And so um, the Swainson's thrush, I have a uh, study scan of a Swainson's thrush here. So here's a Swainson's thrush. And so what we did a few years back is we put some of these uh, light level geolocator tags on the bird. So it goes, these loops go around their legs and then this sits this way actually, on the bird like a little backpack. Um, and this stock on the light level tag, it has a tiny um, solar panel on the, on the top of the stock. And what that is for is not to charge this, but it's to um, capture light. And it also has a little internal clock. And so what this, do, what this uh, light level tag does is it takes information um, every 10 or 15 minutes, I believe, and it, it, uh, it gives an intensity of light and then it also gives the time. And so what it does is it's taking a lot of information and over time you um, get a bunch of peaks that uh, correspond to the highest amount of light intensity in the day or solar noon. Um, and so when you have information on solar noon and what time that was happening, which is uh, recorded using the little clock, then you can um, determine the latitude or longitude. Um, latitude. L latitude is, is the long one. So we're doing it's, longitude. Okay, longitude. Basically how far south the bird is going. <laughs> um, and so that information, um, it, so these were the first types of tags that we were able to put out on birds um, and that it was super exciting because we got information on where our birds go. One bird. Great. Brandon's coming Hi. back with one bird, so we have two birds in. Um, but this was not super precise, so it gives you like, you know, a, a big blob of where the bird may be, so it's in like a hundred mile radius which is awesome because we get to see where, how far south our birds are going, but um, it does not tell us super precisely where they go. Um, and so more recently, we've been able to put these GPS tags on the birds, which act actually give us exact um, points, point locations of where the bird uh, is. They, you can only, um, so we have put the GPS tags out on fox sparrows, and golden crown sparrows, and Swainson's thrushes, and black tipped rose beaks. Um, but the technology is getting better and better, so now you can have more and more GPS points. But um, when we were doing most of these studies, we were only able to get up to 30 points. And so that isn't a lot of points, but it is very precise. So um, we were able to see where exactly our birds are going. So our, um, our swanks and thrushes, as well as our black headed gross beaks, were both going to the Jalisco, Mexico region. Um, and so that was pretty exciting to see that, um, especially with those GPS tags, because when you retrieve a tag, you have to re-catch the bird. So that is something that is quite difficult. Um, so we're, we choose species that we catch a lot of and that we have really good recapture rates for. Um, and so we put tags out and then we have to wait an entire year and hope that we catch that bird yet again. And then we can take the tag off and see where the bird went. Um, and so with those GPS tags, it's very exciting because it shows us exactly where the, um, where the bird goes. Um, yes, question. Um, yeah, what's a study, study skin? Oh, great question. So, um, so I, we have a lot of these study skins. Um, they are various, we have um, species that are found around here. We also have study skins of species that are, um, that are not from around here. But they are uh, 
used for research. So these are real birds that um, they died somehow. Uh, often a lot of these are from like window strikes. Um, and so instead of just throwing out a dead bird, what we do is um, we have uh, help. Most of these came, I think, from the California Academy of Sciences. So they help us um, stuff the bird so that then we can use this to, uh, these we use as outreach tool and also for uh, learning. So all the interns, if we, if, um, we can look at different plumage characteristics um, on the different study skins and learn a lot about, um, about the real birds without having a live bird in your hand. Um, and yeah, so a lot of research actually, so one of the, um, one of the books that we use a lot to, uh, to help us determine the age and sex of birds um, that we catch, a lot of the information in, those, in that book was, um, was compiled using a bunch of study skins, so a bunch of real dead birds that they were able to take a bunch of measurements and look at just hundreds of the same species to look at um, various plumage characteristics that may help us know the age or the sex of a bird. Okay, so we have a bird here. What do we have? Let's spike out here. Cool. Okay, great. Um, I also wanted to say, um, I should have mentioned this earlier, but I didn't, but I'm going to mention now. So we here at the field station, we are, um, you will not see us wearing masks today um, while we're all in here in the banding lab together. Um, and that's because we have been, um, we're functioning as a family unit. So the interns, we have four interns right now who live and work at the field station and so we are all in close proximity to each other um, and function as a family unit. Um, we do have, we take COVID seriously here and we do have a lot of uh, protocols in place when we are outside of the field station doing any other, um, you know, grocery shopping or whatever. We follow all uh, COVID guidelines but when we're here at the field station we are a, a family so that we can work closely together. Um, okay. Great, so we have another migratory species, very exciting. So this is, um, this is an interesting species we could, because we don't actually know what the species is yet. Um, so this is a flycatcher of some sort. Um, this is Brandon. Brandon is yeah. also an intern here. And he's been a banding intern here since March. Yep. Um, we have four banding interns at the moment who will be here through the fall and winter. Okay, let's get some information out because um, so that we can talk about how to determine this species of bird. I need to get the special handling notes out. Okay, so um, I'm going to show the field guide yet again. Uh, Brandon can show that bird real quick, but then I'm going to Nice. Okay. Um, so the first thing that Brandon is going to do right now, and one of the very first things that we ever do when we get a bird, is we either check to see if they have been already banded, and if they are not already banded, we will put a band on this bird. So this bird is not banded yet. <laughs> um, and so Brandon is going to use uh, this leg gauge to determine what size band this bird will get. And so we don't want the band to be too snug or too loose on the bird. We want it to fit well. Um, so this gauge is kind of like um, one of those shoe size things that you would have at like a shoe store to determine what your size shoe is. This is what we use to determine what size band um, is put on a bird. So Brandon has determined that this bird takes a zero A, which is one of our very smallest bands. The only smaller bands we have are for hummingbirds. Um, so these, these flycatchers have very small legs. So he takes the uh, band off of our string of bands here, and then he's going to um, use banding pliers. So these are special pliers that we use to this pin, this pin right here, is used to open up the band, and then these uh, holes in the front are used to close the band around the bird's leg without hurting the bird or crimping the uh, band around the bird's leg. It's a very quick process, um, but one that we, uh, so the interns, they spend a lot of time training to make sure that they're doing 
everything safely and um, handling the bird safely. So now this bird has a band on it with a unique nine digit number. Um, and so if we catch this bird again, we will know exactly who, who it is and um, when we first banded it. Okay, so now I'm going to, while he's writing down his band number, I'm going to show you, um, this is a page of four different types of flycatchers that all look very, very similar. <laughs> and so um, these are called Empidinax flycatchers, and they are a, um, a genus of flycatchers that all look very, very similar. So these are more of them. Um, and so there's very super subtle differences between um, the flycatchers that we have to look at to determine um, what this species is. So one of the first things that we do when we uh, catch one of these flycatchers is we want to make sure that it overall has the uh, color, the, the, feather, the feathers are the color that we would expect it to be. So the most common uh, flycatcher species that we, Empidnex flycatcher species that we have around here is the Pacific Slope flycatcher, um, but they look very similar to the Cordilleran uh, flycatcher, which is further east of here. So um, they are very olivey overall, so their head and back are very olivey, and their breast is yellow. They also have that nice eye ring. We um, say it's an almond-shaped eye ring. Um, they have gray legs, and they also have a nice, so flycatchers have a really flat and wide bill to help them catch flies. Um, and so some species of the Empidinax flycatchers have um, a spade-shaped bill, and some have very straight sides on their bill. So the um, Pacific Slope flycatcher has a spade-shaped bill. Um, and so we want to, we're looking at all of those characteristics and we can do it relatively quickly to determine that it is um, a Western type flycatcher. And then you'll see Brandon is taking a lot of very detailed measurements using the, the uh, wing feathers of this bird. And that is what we use to determine whether we can call it a Pacific slope flycatcher or not. So um, he's doing various um, measurements on the, the feathers of the wing and so the the different and pin next flycatchers have um, they have different like differences in the length of certain feathers, um, and then we use this crazy formula to determine whether or not it is a Pacific Slope flycatcher. Um, Oliver and Brandon, you can ponder um, a question from Lishka, which is. Um, what you find most fascinating about migration. And then when we have a moment, Great. maybe you can answer that. Also, Lishka, it's true, you are hearing an Anna's hummingbird out <laughs> there. It's sitting right outside the window. Yeah, we have a feeder outside, so we get lots of those. Um, Oliver, do you want to answer about migration? Or do you want to have a moment and I will say one more thing about this flycatcher? I'll take a moment. Okay, <laughs> we'll get back to you. So um, one thing I wanted to talk about with this flycatcher is that um, I was showing the GPS and geolocator tags previously. And this is a species that is, uh, it's not big enough for us to put those uh, tags on. So there are some tags that are getting small enough to put on smaller birds. But most of the birds that we have put tags out on are pretty chunky. So Fox sparrow, golden crown sparrow, um, hermit thrush, and swainson thrush, and black the grosbeak. They're all pretty big birds. Um, how many grams does a swainson thrush weigh versus a flycatcher? Uh, our last swainson was 40. Was 40 grams fun. versus. And, uh, usually they're about six for. Six versus 40 grams. So um, these guys are pretty small. Um, and again, the technology is getting to a point where we can, uh, we could put a tag on these birds, but we haven't yet. Um, another thing about these flycatchers is that we, this bird, we can tell is a young bird based on plumage characteristics. And um, typically, young birds do not uh, come back to where they hatch. Um, so we're catching a lot of these birds at this time of year, but we don't actually have very many recaptures. So that's another reason that they're not an ideal species for us to put one of these geolocator tags on. Um, Oliver. Yes. Um, what was the question? So what was 
thing about migration. What do you find most fascinating about migration? Um, for me, how a lot of different species like use have different techniques, I guess, and how to handle flying over long distances. I know there's one bird that really like not like consumes its insides or its guts, but like it sort of does to handle such long distances. I forget what bird it was, maybe it's the goose or something. Um, that's pretty cool to me, and like the fact that. You know, like, we study a lot of birds here in North America, but, you know, there's a lot of, like, gap of knowledge of where they go um, down south, and, you know, like, there's um, more emphasis on, like, the full annual cycle of birds that we don't really know about, um, which is fascinating to me because, like, I don't know, I guess we have more, like, we have more getting stations up in the U.S. and stuff, but... I, don't, I guess like, we don't collaborate as much with banding stations down south in South America. Um, so that would be cool to have. But yeah, it's really interesting how birds can just handle. I mean, I can barely handle walking two miles, so like, let alone fly for thousands of miles. Like, that's crazy to me. <laughs> so yeah. Thanks, Oliver. You're welcome. Uh, that's also, we will talk a little bit about migratory connectivity, which is um, an important uh, thing that we research and or try to research here at the field station. But I just want to take a moment again with this bird, since we do have a bird in the uh, in our hand right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so Brandon, I'm not sure if he has yet determined what species this is. Um, not. Okay, so we're going to do that. this formula later to determine what exactly the species is. But... Um, yeah, so this, uh, <laughs> these Empidnex flycatchers are interesting because we can tell that it's a young bird based on the color of its wing bars. These are the wing bars here. Um, and so not, we don't have a lot of species that are super easy to tell how old they are just based on what their uh, feathers look like, but this is one that's very easy. They keep those for, for long enough for us to say like, this is a young bird because he has very buffy wing bars. It's um, yeah, and so Brandon also took various other um, information on this bird, so he's looking overall at the quality of the feathers on the bird. Um, he took a wing measurement. You can probably go ahead and let that bird go. Cool. We don't like to hold birds on, onto birds too long, especially not longer than we need to. Um, we like to process them and get them back out the door because this is, can be a stressful process for them, so we try to minimize stress as much as possible. Um, a couple of minutes, okay. Um, so this is a wing rule, um, and this is what we use to uh, measure the length of the wing of the bird. Um, that can tell us about the overall size of the bird. Um, and then you may have seen Brandon uh, weigh the bird using one of these little cups. So we stick the bird upside down in a cup. I can do it with one of our study skins. Um, here's a golden crown sparrow. So we stick the bird upside down in the cup um, and then weigh them this way. Um, and so when we put a bird in the cup, their wings are pinned to their side so that they can't flap around a lot. Um, so it's a, a safe way to um, weigh the bird. Um, do you think you could summarize the main ways to identify flycatchers for our fans? Yes. Is like between Empidnax flycatchers or um, flycatchers in general? Lishka just asked what are the main ways to identify flycatchers. So maybe okay. like more okay. generalized. So flycatchers, um, rather than other species, so we have um, groups of birds. We have thrushes and warblers and woodpeckers and sparrows and flycatchers. So flycatchers are a pretty broad um, group of birds. So all flycatchers, uh, I mentioned this before, have very flat, um, flat and wide bills, and those are used, it helps them catch flies. Um, and so that is a, um, a distinguishing feature of all flycatchers um, that we have around here. The other thing is that if you're looking at birds in the field, flycatchers have a very upright posture, um, and a lot of them have kind of a peaked uh, crest, not, not like a super fancy crest like a Stellar's Jay or a Cardinal, but they have a kind of a peak to their head as well. Um, and they 
often will sit on a branch and then fly out Sally and catch a fly and then come back to the branch. So those are some good characteristics to look for when you're out in the field looking for, um, to determine whether something is a fly catcher. When we have a fly catcher in our hand in the banding lab, we go through a lot of different, um, a lot of different things to determine, like I said, uh, that it's a Pacific Slope or a Western fly catcher. Um, and so to first determine that it is a fly catcher, we are looking at the shape of the bill is really helpful for us. Um, and the shape or the size of the leg. So something like a Hutton's Vireo can look very similar to a Western fly catcher, but they have much chunkier legs. So um, these fly catchers have very slight legs. You guys good? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, Brandon and Oliver are going to go out on another net run, so they're checking our nets, and if they catch any birds, they'll bring them back. Um, so the other thing that we we have this lovely um, this is our special handling notes. Uh, this is using a lot of information that we have uh, gathered here at the Fallon Field Station. So we have been banding here at this location since 1966, um, and so we have a lot of information about um, the birds that we have caught here. I hear the weather alarm. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so when we're determining whether it's a Pacific Slope flycatcher or not, um, we're looking at the, um, the shape of the bird, of, of the bill of the bird, so whether it has straight sides or curved sides. Um, and then we're looking at the overall color of the bird as well. So um, some of the fly catchers are much more gray and some of them are much more olive in color. Um, yeah, and so, and then we use a lot of those uh, feather, um, the more precise feather measurements to, to determine um, whether or not it's a Pacific Slope fly catcher, which still, I'm not going to take the time right this moment to do that because um, I feel like I won't be able to do it well um, under pressure right now. So, um, just one moment. Something happening? Just leave. Okay. <laughs> I heard them pulling the net down. I was wondering if there was a bird. Um, okay. Are there any other questions right now, or should I um, move on? To not right now. Yeah, talk about that. Okay. So, um, so you may wonder, maybe you don't, because migration is just super cool and it's interesting to know where birds are going, but you may ask, why is understanding migration an important thing? Um, and so uh, one of the things that is um, important to us, which Oliver actually touched on a little bit, was um, learning about the uh, full life cycle of a bird and the um, throughout the whole year where they're going and what they're doing so their natural history throughout the year um, and so it's really important to know where these birds are going um, if especially if you are interested in conserving a certain species so something like a Swainson's thrush that breeds here we may um, we may know a lot about the um, about the breeding grounds and what type of habitat is important to them on their breeding grounds um, and so we can do things here in North America to um, help conserve and um, even restore habitat for the Swainson's thrush for their uh, for their breeding grounds. But if we don't know what's happening on their wintering grounds, having super nice breeding grounds are not going to be super helpful if they go um, somewhere else for the winter and maybe their habitat on their wintering grounds is being destroyed somehow. Um, and so. Aside from just being super interesting, um, it is important for us to know where these birds are going so that we can make sure that we're conserving um, habitat for these birds um, throughout their full life cycle. Um, and another thing that we um, are interested in learning about um, with these micro species is migratory connectivity. And so what migratory connectivity is, is um, determining how connected a group of birds is on their summer, summer grounds and their winter grounds. Um, so we have determined that our swings and thrushes and our, um, our swings and thrushes have very strong migratory connectivity. The group of birds that breeds here together, they go and they spend their winter very close to each other. 
There are other species that kind of spread out, so they may winter close together here and then they spread out um, throughout their wintering range once they leave. So that's another super important thing to learn because if you, if you have a group of birds, if our group of birds at Palo all go to the same um, ecological preserve down in Jalisco, then we can save that plot of land as well as this plot of land and we can know that our population is doing really well because we have taken care of them across their whole um, life cycle. However, if we have a group of birds here that then spread out across South America, then that's a little bit more difficult for us to determine you know, where we need to um, uh, focus our conservation efforts um, on their wintering ground. Um, and so some of our wintering species here, so the fox sparrows and the um, golden crown sparrows and hermit thrushes, they have a little, they have relatively strong uh, migratory connectivity, but they go a little bit, they have a little bit more of a, um, of a wider range on their summer grounds than they do um, when they're here at Palo in the winter. Um, and so several of those species we have put uh, GPS tags on, so we've been able to see exactly where they go. Um, and they kind of go, the uh, fox sparrows and the golden crown sparrows kind of go along the coast of Alaska, but throughout a relatively large um, range. And don't our Swainson's thrushes and our Wilson's warblers hang out together in Jalisco? We think so. But again, so it's a little bit difficult um, with the, let's see if I have a Wilson's warbler. Um, so the Wilson's warblers are very small. Um, oh, geez. This is why I got those other ones out beforehand. Here we go. Where are the Wilson's warbler? Here it is. So um, with our black-headed rotates and our hermit, thr uh, sorry, Swainson's thrushes, we were able to tell that they go to a very similar place. Um, so this is a Wilson's warbler. This is another common uh, neotropical uh, migrant here. They breed here and they are, we still have them around, but pretty soon their numbers will be going down as they all move south for the winter. And then this is um, a Swainson's thrush. So as you can see, it is a lot smaller than our Swainson's thrush. Um, and so we're, we have not yet put any tags out on uh, Wilson's warblers to tell exactly where they go, but we, we do suspect that they go to a very similar place um, as our Swainson's thrushes because um, we know now that our black the growth beaks and our spices brushes go to very similar places as well. So um, we kind of are making that assumption, but we don't know for sure. But hopefully someday the uh, technology will get small enough for us to put um, GPS tags out on all of our species. So. Um, one question from Anna Kennedy is, um, have you caught any individuals of species that are outside of their usual range this fall? Great question. So um, those, so a species that is outside of its normal range, those we call those uh, vagrants. So sometimes when birds are um, migrating, we are in the bird world, we're in fall right now. This is during fall migration, so birds are moving through. And sometimes um, birds will normally go up the east coast during their migration, but then they sometimes take a wrong turn and they go up the west coast, and so sometimes we catch those birds. It's very exciting for us um, because they're outside of the range that you would expect them to be. This year, so far, what have we caught that was outside of its range? We haven't had very many vagrants. We have had fewer banding days due to fires. Um, so that may be part of it. So the, the last few weeks in August, we were not um, banding here at, the, at Palo or at our other sites. Um, and that's kind of the start of the time when we would expect to be seeing some vagrants. September, we will hopefully get some um, interesting birds as well. But I'm trying to, so this, these birds are all like where they're supposed to be. They're all super exciting though. So. We have caught, in the last few weeks, we've caught several warbler species. Um, this is our summer cap first summer captures and highlights. Um, so we have caught a hermit warbler, a black red gray warbler, Townsend's warbler, and yellow warbler. So lots of warbler species. Um, and they, those are all species that we 
somewhat expect to catch during this time of year. Um, hermit warblers and black-throated gray warblers, they breed in Marin County. Um, they don't breed right here at Palo. And so the, the individuals that we were capturing are um, young birds that are likely moving through and um, heading to their wintering grounds. Um, same with yellow warblers, they do breed in Marin County, but um, we don't catch them here at Palo except in the fall when they're moving through, so. Cool, and Point Blue Conservation Science, which is us, says that our next field live from Palo Marin will focus specifically on vagrants. Um, Great. So that's and that exciting. Is two weeks from now, I believe, so. Yeah, so that, um, that will be good. So today we're just talking about the normal lights, and then um, Mark will be back in a couple weeks to talk about vagrants. Maybe we'll catch a super fun vagrant on that day. <laughs> Um, and then Megan Elrod, she must know this place pretty well because she knows what's behind me. Oh yeah. And she wants us to look at the Perfect. Swainson's Thrush migratory map on the wall, Excellent. which it's true. We have that. Um, <laughs> so the red <laughs> area, the red area is where Swainson's Thrushes, um, breed. And that blue dot, I believe, is where we are. Yeah, birds tagged here. And then that blue area down south is where they winter um, in Mexico. And we also have that map for golden crown sparrow and hermit thrushes. And that information, has, we have written papers about our migratory species and where they go. And if you look on our website, there are links to those papers if you do want to learn more about um, where our birds go and how exactly we determine where our birds go. They have zero birds. Oh, okay. So, no birds, so. Um, okay, so I think that we're kind of going to start wrapping things up now. Um, if anyone else has any questions about things or things that I, clarifying questions if I, Sometimes I go over words that um, I forget are not like normal non-bird world words. So we'll just pause a moment in case anyone has any questions. Cool. Question from Mishka. Great. How's everyone doing after settling back in after the fire evacuation? Yes. Okay. So um, we had a fire here in the Point Reyes National. Okay. So Anna's hummingbirds fighting. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had the uh, Woodward fire was only six or seven miles north of us here um, in the park and so Palo evacuated all of its people and quite a lot of its data as well um, and we were gone for two weeks I believe yes or almost two weeks almost two almost two weeks, weeks um, and we we came back to the field station uh, a week and a half ago now and we are settling in great we're super happy to be back and super happy also that the fire is um, under control now um, I didn't look at containment this morning but it was very high it's not 100% and last time I looked it was 97% so that was great um, yeah and so we're settling back in and making plans for um, digitizing some of our data it's still just sitting out on tables at the moment so that we can uh, get that all under control feel safe again about um, if anything happens in the future that all of our data is just safe. Um, but all of the, all of our interns are back here now. So we have a crew of four interns um, and they will be here through March. Um, so this is our fall winter uh, crew. And so they, um, we have had the full crew here now for just over a week. Um, and so we are super excited to be in the fall season together and learning to band birds and hopefully catching some super fun birds. So um, I don't know if you all want to come back here. Okay. Here's the crew of fall winter banders. You've said hi to Oliver. This is Brandon okay. um, and Caroline and Sophie. And so they are, um, some of them are returning um, interns. Sophie was a banding intern last year and she came back um, to band with us again this year. Caroline was uh, on the Spotted Owl crew for Point Blue this uh, past summer, and she migrated to Palo to become a Palo intern. Um, Brandon was a banding intern this past spring.
spring summer. And Oliver was a nest searching intern at Palomarin um, this past spring summer. So this is our crew. We're here to, to learn about birds for the next many months. Um, and so they will be here with us um, in future live visits as well. Um, yeah, as well myself, Hillary, and Mark, who is the other supervisor here at the Palomar Field Station. Um, so again, you can look at the other California Biodiversity Day events um, that are happening. Uh, there are quite a few events actually happening today, um, and that link will be on the Facebook page. Um, and then there should also be a donate button and a link to our um, website as well to if you want to learn more about what we do or if you want to support the, the work that we do here at the Palomar Field Station. You good? Um, yeah. Cool. We have one more question. One more question. Okay. Last question. Uh, Didi Sabag asked, what are the most common birds you tag at this time of year? So the most common birds that we're uh, catching and just putting bands on are, um, we're catching a lot of swings and thrushes. So those, uh, we have quite a few of those here in the uh, spring and summer, but we catch quite a lot of them as well during this migration period. So as they're moving through, we're catching a lot of swings and thrushes. We're catching a lot of those impenax flycatchers, so um, the Pacific, mostly Pacific Slope flycatchers, some Western flycatchers. Wilson's warbler numbers are, they start to dwindle at this time of year. There's a lot of song sparrows. So song sparrows are a species, they're a resident species, so they um, live here year round, but they kind of move around a lot. All the young birds are moving around trying to figure out where they're going to um, set up territory for um, stay year round. So there's a lot of movement of local birds as well. So we're catching a lot of song sparrows. And those are probably some of our highest captures. The swings and thrushes, um, Pacific Slope flycatchers, song sparrows, and Wilson Cool. All right. Sounds good. Thank you so much for joining us, um, and we hope to see you all in the future. Great.